so I said before that I, if I needed a lawyer, I wouldn't know where to go. So I'm very thankful that Nathan McPherson and the McPherson Group are supporting Raw, because it just so happens that within a few weeks of them reaching out to advertise here, I needed a lawyer. And I can tell you so far, the McPherson Group has been fantastic. They've taken what was a complex, not dangerous, but complex situation, and strategically, quickly, fixed it. You can find them at beatirs.com. That's B-E-A-T-I-R-S dot com, or you can call them 1-800-B-E-A-T-I-R-S. They specialize in tax law and are more than happy to help mom and pop clients, homeowners, pastors, and churches deal with any thorny issues that might come up. One small business in Wisconsin that allegedly owed over $30,000 was able to settle for one-third of one cent on the dollar. That's $100 was the final settlement. They wrote, Nathan, thank you so much for helping me in this whole thing. May God bless you and your business. Again, the McPherson Group, beatirs.com, 1-800-BEAT-IRS. I tell you, I'm a fan. So I had a real treat this week as a good friend of mine came into town. He's an old friend. I'll talk a little bit more about who he is and, and our relationship in the show itself. But we sat down and we had a great conversation. It went for about two and a half hours. We didn't record all of it. We stopped about an hour in. And I don't know if everything that came afterwards would have been something that you would have been interested in or if he would have enjoyed uh, just having be public knowledge. But we talked about what you might call pre- pastoral or practical theology. We talked about preaching. We talked about what it means to be the church. We talked about living together as as the people of the church and the politics of the church. We're not talking church-wide assemblies. We're talking about in your congregation. And we talked about the mission of the church. So I really do hope you enjoy this week's episode of Raw as I sat down with my good friend, Pastor Adam Kuntz, and, well, we we just kind of let it fly. So I'm sitting here in my pretend study slash studio with my, my good friend, Pastor Adam Kuntz. Adam and I first met each other when I was serving as a pastor and sort of missionary in the Philadelphia area, and he was a member of a local church and attended a college-age Bible study that I went to. I got to know him and his bride-to-be, Jennifer. I got to perform their wedding, and then I I left. But, But he also left and went to the seminary. Now, he's a pastor out at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. And how old are you now, Adam? I am 64 this August. No, you are not. You're, what, 25? Uh, 26? Now? Yeah. I am going to be 32 in a No month. way. Yes, sir. Oh, man. Okay, so he's 32. So he's not as young as I think he is. Um, but he's he's a pastor out in the area now and doing a lot of good stuff. He's not only serving this one congregation, which uh, certainly has come into some good situations since you've been there in terms of its understanding of the word. We, we can maybe talk about that a little bit more, but then also starting a new mission church out there as well, Concordia Lutheran Mission, uh, which is in Lancaster County area. Concordia is in Lebanon County, so that's just to the north of Lancaster County. And in Pennsylvania, there's generally one Missouri Synod Church per county. Um, roughly anywhere between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Okay. Um, so Lebanon County doesn't have one, so that's why we're starting one. Right. So you're working to do that on the side. Right. And you can learn more about that, by the way, at concordialc.org, which is stunning. No Concordia Lutheran Church got that website address until, what, a year ago? You, you went and grabbed it? Yeah, that? maybe two years ago we went live with that, so yeah. And then you also are a regular guest on a podcast called A Word Fitly Spoken. You're not actually a host of that show. I am I not a host. I'm I'm a perpetual guest, yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Willie Grills and Zelwyn Heidi are the hosts. And um, I've come on to discuss usually pastoral theology, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later, um, partly because I think that pastoral theology is one of the most neglected but also most important realms uh, of study for theology, and it's, I, I would say it's actually under-theologized, huh. um, such that if we're thinking about especially the pastor as a man, which you can, if you go to Word Fitly Spoken, you can listen to the two episodes we did on George Henry Gerberding's uh, The Lutheran Pastor. Um, he talks a lot about the pastor as a man, um, what kind of man he is, 
and that that is in so many ways determinative for the well-being of the church, which is why Paul focuses on it too in his pastoral epistles. I thought that those episodes with Gerbertine were fascinating. It, it probably is what hooked me, and I've gone back and listened to the show since then, but nothing's really compelled me the way that those two episodes did. And I hadn't really thought about it, but the things that I do want to talk to you today about would fall under the, the locus, the, the place of pastoral theology. As I've been listening to you on that show, uh, talking about Gerberdine, talking about Walther, you've been letting a few ideas out, which I don't, they're not Missouri Synod orthodoxy. And by that, I'm not talking, I don't think, theology, although pastoral theology is theology, but I'm talking about some of the assumptions about what it means to be Lutheran, right. as the Missouri Synod would think that that means, and how this has impacted our practice. And I'm not talking about using praise bands and doing all the weird stuff. I'm talking about good conservative practice is maybe not as good or conservative on all things as we want to think that it is. And so as I've picked up on those, what struck me is there are things that I've been thinking about too. And Again, you being my my student at one point and much younger than me, I'm like, wow, I had 10 years on this guy, and he's already figuring out what I'm just now coming to. And so I, I'm wondering how much of this is just your own experience. Uh, and with no, I don't want to you know, blow you up, but you you are an intellect. You're, you're a force to be reckoned with intellectually, and I think your undergrad showed that as well. Um, but with, with the work you're doing with Gerberdine and Walther, I'm curious how much of this is you're actually finding this was their view as well, and we've got this other thing that we call Lutheran Orthodoxy that we've been uh, piling in on. And so to throw it at you, I want to start with preaching. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and maybe, because maybe I'm, I'm misreading between the lines what I've heard you say, uh, but I've heard you speak about pastor in the pulpit giving attention to verse-by-verse exposition of the text. Well, nobody does that in the Missouri Synod, Adam. Uh, I do. I've been doing it for about two and a half, three years. I adore it. It is uh, the easiest way to preach, by far, in my mind. It takes away a lot of the headache. But it also, I've found, and I don't think I ever had trouble holding a congregation's attention, but I've found, like, Whatever trouble I did have from time to time, it's gone now. If I if I do expository preaching, I've got the whole room, and I've got them for 25, 30 minutes, and they don't mind. Is that what you meant? And then how did you come to that conclusion? Okay. Uh, yeah, that is what I meant. And uh, I meant that because I became a Lutheran after having been an Episcopalian. And the reason that I came to the Missouri Synod was because of the authority of Scripture. But I recognized that the authority of Scripture as a theological assertion is one thing, and that's good, and that's valuable. In fact, it's it's actually essential that we maintain that. But then there's also the practical authority of Scripture, and that is uh, in the pastor's preaching. Does he show that the absolute most important thing to him is to tell the congregation what God says? Does he present himself as a messenger, or is he in some sense um, an entertainer? or someone who is in some manner um, trying to keep a congregation interested in a text uh, in which he himself is not maybe terribly interested or, or, does, or is rather uncomfortable. Um, so verse by verse exposition of scripture, which could take the form depending on the genre of, that you're dealing with, whether it's a story or a proverb or an epistle, you know, the, the sermon is going to have a different form depending on the genre of scripture, but that means that I'm putting both not only what I say, as in my doctrine must be pure, but also how I say it under scripture's authority. I'm letting scripture present its own thoughts to the congregation um, in the manner that it has chosen to present those things. Mm. And I'm not apologizing for it or trying to dress it up. I think that on its face, this often sounds dull if people have never heard it. Hmm. But if you do it, or if you have heard it, you realize that it is, as you're saying, like the most possible, the most interesting possible thing you could do, because you're letting God's word just be unfolded for his people. And it's actually both sufficient and filling and wonderful for them. So um, that's, that's what I do. Hmm. Um, this warmed my heart a couple of weeks ago, a lady came up to me and said, you know, she asked me what Bible version we use because <clears throat> she wanted to get into Bible. 
And she said, I thought I knew the Bible until I came to this church. And I was like, yeah, that's good. You know, that, that, that should be a disciple's experience. That's certainly my experience as the preacher. So I want that to be the congregation's experience too. Um, the reason I came to that view, um, is actually, that's not through Walther. It's, I don't, I mean, I don't want to sound trite, but it, it's through the Bible for this reason. I realized that I was trying to really overthink how I was presenting God's word. And instead of doing it that way, I basically just thought, well, if this were like a book, how would I talk about it? Hmm. And so I just started talking about it as if it were a book. And I'm trying to relay to someone else, what are the contents? Why does it matter to me? Why do I care? And then it all became much easier. And I, I came to that conclusion when I was when I was on vicarage um, that I should preach this way. So how'd this go over with your fourth year home class? <laughs> it was. I, I mean, I think it was. I think it was fine. I mean, in in fourth year, if I remember correctly, they were we were doing more like, you know, not relying on a manuscript all the time, which wasn't a problem for mm-hmm. me. So right. I think that that also has something to do with it. I think the preacher has much more confidence. Because if you go to a Missouri Synod church and you go to you go to the service and then you go to Bible class, the pastor is probably a lot more comfortable talking for basically an hour in right. Bible class than he is for 12 to 15 minutes in the sermon. And why is that? I think it's partly because he understands that he's just relaying a message in Bible class, whereas the sermon feels, for a lot of guys, I think, more like a, an act. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to be you know trite, but... And so it's hard for them. And I think if they thought about it more like they think about Bible class, you know, sans, you know, coffee by their side, if they just presented God's word, it would go much more smoothly and the people would be much more engaged. Yeah. I think that people would, I mean, it's not that they're not listening, but they're not, they're not learning. They're not coming away knowing more. And and it's not like it's just about knowledge. It's not like it's just have to understand you know, a bunch of facts, but I have to have this worldview inculcated to me, right? I have to have my, my mind renewed and the, uh, the spiritual entertainment of the 15 minute oratory that is not even really being, you you mentioned it, it's like, it's a play almost, right? And the way I see this is it's a play and we're writing a script every week and we're spending a great deal of time writing the script so much so that we're so in love with it that we get up and we read it verbatim rather than spend time learning to memorize it and deliver it as if I actually knew the thing, right? So we've become people who are uh, writing uh, dramatic theses and then giving lectures in which we just read from our notes as opposed to anything that the, the scriptures call preaching, right? And it, am I wrong in this? I mean, if I say to you, it's like we're, we've learned to preach from Cicero rather than from Paul. It, does that make sense? And would you, how would you respond to that? I would respond to that by saying that Cicero is much better organized and much less predictable <laughs> because I think that the people pick up on the idea that for a lot of Lutheran churches, and, and we keep saying entertainment, and so I think people are thinking like we're bashing some certain part of the synod yeah. by saying no. entertainment. I'm not. I actually, my conviction is that in a, in a lot of the most liturgically conservative churches, people are hearing essentially the same thing as they are in our absolute, like most uh, contemporary churches. Hmm. They're hearing uh, sin is bad, Jesus is really good, the end yeah for yeah. almost any text almost any sunday and i don't think that i don't personally have the time or energy to get everyone to go to bible class every single sunday so that they can get deeper stuff than that hmm. so i need to do the deep stuff now so that the christians can learn now and right. then if they want to go to bible class then they can get we're going through acts right now or something but like in the sermon the sermon is designed and walther talks about this with the with the church year you know, on each Sunday, and you can find charts like this in, you know, on the internet, each Sunday, what is the major doctrine I'm trying to preach this Sunday? So like for Epiphany, it's wedding at Cana, or yeah, Epiphany 1. So you're going to talk about marriage. So give yourself some time to do that, you know. Um, and that, 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 that really helps the congregation marvelously in a way that I, I think that preaching kind of goal malady means or law gospel however you want to say it really like as a sermon form every single sunday um 
we're starving people if that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. So you just mentioned gold malady means. This podcast is largely listened to by laity and not by by pastors that I know of. And so gold malady means is a seminal how to preach work for the Missouri Synod from the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, is it 80s? Car- oh, Camerer. It's the 60s. Is I want to say it's 60s. the 60s, yeah. And in my own head, uh, I lay a lot of the issue at his feet uh, and his basically teaching us that the sermon should take the form of law, gospel, law-ish, depending kind of on the back end. Um, is that where you think this came from? Because uh, it's so ingrained. It, it's so ingrained that I don't think most guys, this is why I was surprised to hear you talk about it. I don't think it's a question anyone's asking. No one's saying what's wrong with our conservative preaching right now, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and that's because I think that I think that if you think like, well, I'm getting the doctrine correct, then it's fine. And in some sense, that's like that's true. You're not sending anybody to hell by preaching that sin is bad and and Jesus is good and Jesus is the savior. That's true. But um, Paul uses doctrine, um, and he says there are many uses for doctrine. Um, and this is where Walther goes in his pastoral theology when he talks about preaching. Um, it's, it's for reproof, it's for correction, it's for training in righteousness. Um, God's word has so many uses um, simply to convict people that they are original sinners and that Jesus is the savior from sin is a, is a part of the Christian doctrine. It is, in fact, the center, the beating heart of Christian doctrine, but it is not the only Christian doctrine. Mm. Um, so that what's interesting about Kemmerer's formula is that Kemmerer himself is at St. Louis from, I want to say, the 40s, maybe mid-40s. That's when the faculty really starts to change. Mid-40s to the walkout in 74. Uh, but his formula endures, Stays even there. though he leaves. Yeah, yeah. Which is well, weird. So for the listener again, so with Seminex and the walkout and the saving of the Bible, we retained a primary practical teaching from that liberal mindset, which has formed the way that the best of our preachers still are at least taught how to do this. And so you, you had this uh, revelation on vicarage. It started for me about two or three years outside, but I didn't really get all the way until just like the last three years again, when I was spending a, a great deal of time trying to figure out what I was supposed to preach. I had the text, but I didn't know what I was supposed to say to the people this week, right? And it, it struck me that in a certain sense, I was actually, there, the story is that I was talking to a buddy of mine, and I, I said, what are you preaching this week? And he said, I'm letting Paul preach. And I said, huh? He said, well, it's, it was like Colossians 2. He said, well, it's all laid out for you. It's a sermon in a, in a box. Just, just say what the text says. I was like, that's genius. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll do this again. And so I, I, I gradually started moving in that direction uh, to do this. But uh, I don't know. I had a question I was working toward, and I kind of lost it there. Uh, what worries me about this then, though, is that that means – we pride ourselves on being people who say we're going to listen to the word of God this Sunday. And then the, the and pride ourselves on being pastors who get up and say, I'm preaching the word of God. Right. But then we're preaching our words more than the word of God. And that's terrifying in a almost apocalyptic sense, right? I mean, like you said, you used the Im- image of starving people earlier. So I don't know, just if you, if you want to respond to any of that or, again, explain how did you come to, to – what jarred you to make you think this isn't right? Well, I think I think that preaching expositorily is, is maybe like the most humbling thing a preacher could do because I don't have any illusion that I, that I like know everything hmm. ever because every week – and I, I use the one-year lectionary, so I'm going back to the same text year by year – even so, I dig into it. I find a million new things each time that I'm doing it. So um, what convicted me of this was the first practical experience of seeing people in need of, especially instruction for life, let's say wisdom, and not having it. And my preaching a sermon that tells them that they are sinners and that Jesus is their savior, they know that. They're starving for some way to understand how to live life after having, you know, wanted to commit suicide, how do I go on thinking about why I'm supposed to get up in the morning? Stuff like that. And understanding that God's word is also sufficient for those things. 
um, not only the most basic possible message I could give them. So that for me was the convicting thing. God's people actually need this. It, it's also in my background and as much as I didn't become a Missouri Synod Lutheran in order to mm. hear the gospel. I became a Missouri Synod Lutheran because I was living in a church which was completely devoid of Christian maturity because it was devoid of God's word. And therefore, you know, the, the most basic issues that you might think of with a liberal Protestant denomination, let's say women's ordination or the understanding of scripture, that's not the half of it. Hmm. When you live in the life of a local congregation, which is trying to subsist without any knowledge of God's word whatsoever. But then I find that in my experience, a lot of Missouri Synod congregations are trying to subsist without God's word. And while they're not running off having, you know, gay marriage be the main thing going on, there's all sorts of, well, uh, legalistic, conscience binding, uh, gossip mongering, uh, hatred for neighbor, basically, uh, running amok. And, you know, we, we maybe move toward the voters assembly here uh, slowly, but that's the place where you, you end up seeing a group of people come together and not act like Christians right. at all. And, and the common refrain is, well, that's just the way it is. And it's, and it's so sad because I, I can't tell you how many, like, clergymen's sons I know hmm. who didn't want to be pastors because of, they saw their father go through the voters assembly. It's like, has nothing to do with comforting the dying or proclaiming God's word or anything. They just think about how miserable their dad was and then they don't want to go into the ministry. I mean, I think before I say anything else about polity or structure or something, I, I think that if you look at the book of Acts, I would say that polity and conflict in the church are a function of trust and trust is a function of Christian maturity hmm. Hmm. such that Paul can trust people because Paul is mature in Christ and he understands what matters and he understands what really doesn't matter. If you look at the church in Jerusalem, um, whether you're talking about the Council of Jerusalem earlier on in Acts, or you're saying later on when Paul arrives and they say to Paul, people are going to be upset if you do things this way. Here's what you need to do. You know, telling him who has accomplished so much more than they have, right? what he's supposed to do here. And he goes along with it because he's mature. <laughs> but Polity and trust and conflict are always a function of the maturity of the people you're dealing with. Polity can be helpful, but it, it can't be an answer simply because if you don't have Christians who know God's word and therefore understand how to conduct themselves and what matters and what the ultimate goal is here, then you're going to have Christians who have mistrust and gossip mongering and all the rest of it because they simply don't, in a sense, they don't know any better. Right. And, and you're advocating then that that maturity, which creates that trust, comes from an, not, not, a, not a topical knowledge of the scriptures, but an actual knowledge of the texts, the, the bare texts of scripture. Um, I got two more things and then we'll move on sure. out of the preaching. And, and these come out of what you were saying before. Uh, one is uh, how much, I remember expository preaching being something that was sort of scoffed at at the seminary they, they kind of threw a hat tip to it like sure. you could do this right you know right, right, right. The, the, the reformed do this <laughs> right and they spend all this so time talking about one word for like an hour and actually I, I remember seeing them do that and it's like that is not good either you can right. you can over micro zeal yourself on yeah you the, can do your, the your nine particles. years in romans yeah right yeah. uh so so you got that issue and I'm, I'm curious though so what what's with the scoffing but then also what you said before with the individual who was trying to figure out how to live their life and have some basic wisdom. This cuts like a knife through the very pedantic online argument about the third use of the law right now, right? Like, we wouldn't be having an argument about, oh, you need more law preaching if we just taught the text. The text would actually do all of it for us. You couldn't tell me that I wasn't preaching the law because I I to it's there right this is what it means uh so thoughts about that as well and 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 this this idea like do we need more third use like or is it just we need more scripture i would say that and i'm speaking out of my experience as somebody who became a christian as a as a thinking adult as a reasoning adult is that the third use of the law debate is a learned debate hmm. Because when you become a Christian and you're not a Christian, it is self-evident that Christians live in ways that are different from non-Christians because the Holy Spirit dwells within them. All of this stuff, nobody ever told me not to believe any of that. Yeah, right. 
<laughs> so I had to learn to think of the law as this like massive problem in my life. I mean, I understood that I didn't keep God's law perfectly, but to think of it as a massive theological problem, I learned that when I became a Lutheran. Hmm. Before I was, I mean, and in fact, I became a Lutheran partly because I thought, well, they teach the Bible. So, you know, they, they like God's law, whereas Episcopalians don't because they don't like the Bible. If you like the Bible, you like wisdom. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where that went for me. Um, I think that if you're teaching the text, you don't have to talk around it. You don't have to erase the law somehow with the gospel. Um, and this is, I mean, there are people that are wiser on the, on the idea of like the theology of the law. Like I would recommend David Scare's Law and Gospel and Means of Grace volume in the Confessional Lutheran Dogmatic series for people that haven't read that. Um, but as far as the practical use of the law, um, yeah, no parish pastor who is doing his job is going to say that the law is something that he wants to get rid of because mm -hmm. if his people know God's word, if he knows God's word, they want the wisdom as well as the conviction, but also the wisdom that that offers. And that's, that's a, I mean, that's a lot of times what you can see Paul, Peter, John, Jesus themselves doing. When you told a story on A Word Fitly about a seminary professor who can peg a Missouri Synod preacher anywhere, he said, it sounded yeah, that, like a that little was bit a of that was, that was a university professor in the history department at Temple where I'm getting my doctorate. Right. And his dad had been a professor at Concordia. It was River Forest then. Yeah. Well, you can tell the story better than I can. So yeah. So I'll ask about it. It was funny. It was, well, because the last day uh, we had a we had a, a, a conference um, and we presented our papers from the work that we had done that semester. And so this was this is part of the dissertation I'm writing on the passages where Paul says, imitate me. Hmm. And uh, the people who are most like Paul in the ancient world are not really missionaries explicitly, they are philosophers. So I wrote a paper about the cynic philosopher Diogenes and his travel and why he traveled and why he left his home, and because that's kind of unusual for human beings generally. Why would you leave your home to go mm. proclaim something to somebody else you don't already know? And I'm presenting this paper and uh, I was lazy or indifferent or whatever, and so I didn't give the introducer uh, a bio. And so she like, <laughs> pulled my name off the internet and it said that I was senior pastor of Mount Calvary Lutheran Church or whatever. So this is like a, this is like a reveal because as far as he knows, I'm a graduate student from the religion department. And, um, he comes up to me after the paper. He's like, that was a great paper. I had no idea you were Missouri Senate. Hmm. <laughs> he was hmm. shocked. I, 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 I think it partly had to do with an attitude towards other people is how he kind of explained it. I wasn't. That's what I want to know then. So what do we do culturally <laughs> that's got this guy, again, when you told the story, it sounded elitist, like he's looking down his nose at us. He said, he said, I can spot them a mile away because he himself is one. And, and it was interesting. He goes to an ELCA church, but he said, I can spot a Missouri Synod, a former Missouri Synod guy when he's preaching in my church. Hmm. He said, because there's an assertiveness there. And it's interesting, this professor, I mean, his name is, it's Andrew Eisenberg. He's going, he took a new chair at University of Kansas. He teaches Western history. I don't know why he was in Philadelphia to begin with, but hmm. great guy, fascinating guy. And he's very, he is unusually assertive. And I think that he did not, he did not see that same, because he has really definite opinions about things like adverbs. Right. Whereas my attitude when somebody's writing or preaching is, what do you do? How can I help you do that better? If you do 50% more adverbs than I do in a sermon, that's fine. Right. That's, that's right. you. His attitude towards things is much more dogmatic, I would say. So is, is it the things that we're assertive about? No, it is our personality, which endures whatever the doctrine is, is what he's saying. Oh. And, I, and I, I, I think experientially that is true. Huh. Uh, he but, said, but he said you you he said i don't have it but he, you're a very assertive person he so had no the, idea that you're I one of the most convicted and convicting people i've ever listened to <laughs> he, said, he said i had no idea that oh, you were misery synod so yeah i i yeah i don't i don't know what it was but it was it was kind of fun i was i don't know i guess i was like totally totally crypto he had no idea who i was because well, what it makes me wonder about again is you know what's in our water that we're drinking that's making us behave and act in certain ways that we assume is Lutheran, but maybe is, well, not maybe, that we're not actually getting from Scripture 
or the Lutheran confessions? And then how much is that in the way of the actual mission work of the church right now in the age that we see? Because I think there's a thought that we can just sort of set up a Missouri-style pulpit somewhere and people will flock to it if we just did it, right? And and just, uh, it, it's two-sided. It's get rid of the organ or if we just keep the organ, right? And, and then everyone will flock there. And I don't think that's right. My own wrestling with the idea of mission, and I'm thinking, convicted by you a little bit as well, um, uh, one-on-one conversation with people I don't know about the death and resurrection of Jesus and if I want my congregation to ever do that, I've got to do that. Right. Um, I, 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 I think I think that um, from the perspective of being neither genetically nor geographically um, native to the Missouri Synod, it's clear to me that many of the debates that we have in the Missouri Synod take place within a context of pre-existent Lutheran populations huh. who either desire a certain kind of worship or desire a pastor with a certain kind of personality or desire a church with or without a school. Um, and that, you know what, those are totally fine debates to have. I'm not going to arrive in the Midwest and tell everybody what to think and how to do things. But it is helpful if you exist in a culture where you are completely unknown to introduce yourself with a knowledge of your major text, which is the Bible, not synodical CTCR statements or whatever, you, your, your major knowledge is of the main text that you need people to believe. Hmm. And what you're trying to do is convey to them who Jesus Christ is. Beyond that, um, what I do based on my own training and theological conviction is a pretty standard. And if you went to the Concordia website, you would see this as well as Mount Calvary's website, mclclitits.org. We do a liturgical service um, communion every Sunday, um, all the rest of it. Um, and we do that for consistency's sake and for beauty's sake. We don't mm. do that because I'm angry at somebody else about doing things differently. So, um, and but you that, wouldn't call that necessarily the, the mission work either, right? I, mean, I it, think, I, I actually think it's a big part of mission Yeah. because, uh, you can't get that in the world anymore. Yeah, it's true. You can't get a pastor who knows your name and and cares about you and will check up on you if you're absent from church. You can't get an experience of a ritual with a bunch of other human beings like that, which is commonly meaningful. Um, and you cannot get the sense that you have entered into the very gate of heaven. And all those things are what we're offering in the divine service. So I do teach people. I mean, I say like the service was not set up as evangelism and it doesn't need to be. Let's be clear about that. But it is a part certainly of the journey of people into our communion, not only talking about doctrinal convictions and, and things like that, but also experiencing beauty, uh, which is purposefully otherworldly. Hmm. We don't have that. We have things that are for sale. We have <laughs> student loan debt. We have uh, struggling to buy a house. We, we don't have otherworldly beauty in our lives. And that is something that I think our church is uniquely positioned to offer. There's nothing transcendent. And no. uh, I, I don't doubt at all that this is some of the appeal that Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam have to secularized Americans is they, they come with that uh, you know, we used to call it, what do we call that? Swerve. Uh, swerve is the, the, um, is the that sexual a, is that attractiveness. A 90s term? Maybe. It's okay. the sexual attractiveness of somebody from another country. Like they okay. might not really be that attractive, but yeah. because they have whatever the Czech, Exotic. Uh, you know, yes. yeah, Czech yes. accent, they're, they got swerve. So uh, it's, those other religions have that swerve. And, and this is the argument, so far as I've seen it, about liturgy. You know, we've been rejecting our uniqueness. And, and perfectly positioning ourselves to die with the rest of evangelicalism rather than to just cling on to what is a very ancient and appealing thing. But I, but I, I, I don't think that that's, or at least for me, that's not what I'm wrestling with. I, I'm wrestling with the bigger question of what are the words, you know, you mentioned that you got to have the text that you know. What are the words that I use to have the conversation or how do I find the conversation with somebody who's out there on the street, um, and, and maybe that's not where we quite want to go. But but as you're talking about 
you know, the mission plant that you are starting, you know, what was the genesis of that? You, you know, you said there's not a, there's not a congregation there. What well, was that the whole thinking? And then you mentioned to me earlier that a lot of that is Missouri Synod transplant at this point, right? The, the ones that are there. So that's not really, it's not like you're converting pagans at this point. So we have a few. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I guess I would start with the evangelism thing. I mean, the reason to do one-on-one in modern America is because modern America is a society completely dominated by consumer desire. Hmm. So it's very hard to do things in terms of people groups. That was the thinking, that was the genesis, first in India and then transferred by Donald McGavran to the United States in classic church growth thinking was targeting people groups. And those dissolve increasingly um, with the advent of internet subculture and stuff like that. Hmm. You're, you're si- the size of a people group, or if you look in a given neighborhood, what are people into? What are people's thoughts on the world? That is incredibly hard to predict these hmm. days, which is why I recommend to people and myself do one-on-one. That's how I do catechesis mm-hmm. in our church. I don't do classes. Yep. Um, and I do that partly for the sake of conveying that we actually care about them one-on-one. And partly so that I can answer their questions one-on-one because their life experiences are massively diverse, Um, even though Lancaster County is probably 85% white. I mean, it's not not demographically diverse outside of Lancaster City largely. And Lebanon County is not terribly diverse either. Um, But people's thoughts on the world and and life experiences and stuff have been so fragmented by uh, a combination of societal breakdown and consumerism. Um, I don't know who anybody is until I talk to him. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to him, and this is the way that we've worked on things so far with evangelism, both at Mount Calvary and at Concordia, um, I'm trying to figure out, first of all, I'm listening. I'm not trying to force him to um, listen to what I'm going to say. I don't want him. He already thinks I'm going to say something mm-hmm. um, because I'm a Christian and not a Hindu or a Buddhist. So I'm not, I'm not cool. I don't have any cultural appeal. So first I'm going to find out what is driving him. What is he all about? This is where a really basic understanding of law and gospel is absolutely essential for evangelism. Christianity is the only religion that offers law and gospel. Mm. I want to find out what is the law that is driving him? What does he think is most important? How is he currently justifying his existence? And then I will try to destroy whatever idol is running Mm. that justification and then replace it with Christ. Mm. So that's where we go. That's how we train people. The genesis of Concordia really comes out of a desire to spread that more widely because we have people driving 45 minutes to an hour from, I think, three or four counties to come to Mount Calvary. I thought it was time to plant a church. We've been around for 114 years. We have never started a church. So mm. it's also very healthy for, I mean, if you're not part of a mission church right now, um, it's very healthy for the congregation that does it because it gives them a really, really good sense of what is their church actually for mm. besides themselves. Mm. Yeah, yeah, to push uh, what they have and share it with others. Uh, one of my... One of my fears in my current station is if we walk through some very challenging times that I think we're going to walk through and come out real good on the other side, that we're going to be like, hey, cool, let's sit down. And that's the last thing I want. I want us to say, now let's do something with this this tool we've just found. Mm-hmm. And, and and in that, that's where then, again, your your conversation, I think this was out of Gerberding, that if the if the congregation is going to be a, oh, I, I can't believe I'm using this term, a mission-minded congregation. <laughs> mission, uh, mission-minded is not bad. Yeah. Well, it was 12 years ago. It was code language for uh, not you real Lutherans in the Missouri Synod. Right. Um, if you're going to have a congregation that is attentive to evangelize, see, all these terms have been abused, though. Evangelizing, yeah. church yeah. planting. I mean, all these terms have been filled with things that are, in my mind, almost diabolical. <laughs> But is spreading the gospel. Uh, if we're going to replicate our congregations and have more of them and have new Christians, uh, we have to be intentional about this. And I think it does come back to the preaching. But uh, we, oh, this was the Gerberding thing. Uh, it, it also then you said that Gerberding says that if the congregation is going to do this, the pastor's got to do it first. And if they don't, if they don't, you can just kind of. Re- yeah. Re- replicate that it was along the lines of 
there's a sociological thought that uh, I'll use the proverb that it was told to me with that when you get to a parish, all of its problems are what was wrong with the last guy. When you've been <laughs> yeah. there 15 years, all of its problems are what's wrong with you, right? And and so there's a certain sort of literal parental emulation going on where the parish does just sort of become who the pastor is. And this does get to why Paul is pretty concerned with who you put into this role. And he says, yeah, how you raise your kids has something to do with it, right? How you handle your finances has something to do with it. How you handle your drink has something to do with it. Uh, and and so go back into that with Gerberding. Is that where that came yeah, from? Yeah, that came mind? from Gerberding, and, and Gerberding got it from Paul. I think that imitation is absolutely unavoidable in life. So the question is really, are you going to be intentional and fruitful about it? Or is it just going to gradually, will the parish and your children take on the worst aspects of you? Hmm. Because that's easy to do. It's easy for my kids to imitate the worst things about me. It comes basically preloaded in sinners. Um, I think something that you notice if you think for, you know, five seconds about anybody you know, is that original sin plays out differently in different families. Uh, some people are more prone to the sins of their fathers mm. uh, than others, and uh, that's no different from the pastor in the parish. So I guess what I would say about the pastor-congregation relationship there is that like when Paul is talking about being a father to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4 and saying that he's going to send his true child in the faith, Timothy, to, to stir them up by way of reminder that they can see in Timothy how Paul is and so see the way of Christ that people will always know how to follow Christ through the person who has taught them. Hmm. And that when the pastor is intentional about that, that is all kinds of good for the parish. That is also, lest anyone think that this is kind of a power play, and I think we'll talk, we can talk about polity here. Right. Being a father is the worst power play anyone has ever done. Because whether you're talking about being a father to your biological children or a father to a congregation, that is the most humbling, searing experience that a man can have. Because you have to examine everything you do and think, why do I do this? Is it worthy of emulation or is it not? Um, what am I doing that is building up these people that I love and that I'm responsible for? This gets directly to the issue of trust that you brought up earlier, and that'll get us back into polity. Because... It, the, the, the issue, I think, in my experience in the majority of Missouri Synod parishes that I've been in is that people assume the pastor is not asking those questions. He is not thinking, uh, how can I best serve this people? Instead, somehow he's after authority he's over after, them. He is some after way. something. Yeah, it's yeah. and usually power. Power. Just just the raw power of controlling this group of 40 people for an hour a week. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a bizarre and culturally inbred thing. I mean, in, all I've ever heard people say, and this is like scholastic level, is, well, this is the Martin stuff on issue. We never handled it. We sent them across the river, and we're still living in it. It's like, well— crap, I guess we are. You know, is that really what it is? Is it an American distrust of authority and an anti-government uh, approach? And then what does this mean for, you mentioned, uh, you know, emulating the worst things, and we, we dropped the voters' assembly idea before. One of the other things you've, you've had happen at Mount Calvary is you have restructured your congregation uh, you've done so within the bounds of Missouri Synod's oversight, so clearly you didn't do anything too weird. But that kind of talk in the last 15 years has only been the kind of talk that comes out of church growth power plays to actually take control away from the voters' assembly and put it in the hands of the divinely inspired leader, which is, you know, uh, fascism. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, is that? But that's not what you're talking about. And yet, I don't know what other language to use because I've seen the same experience. We have we have set up a, a situation where we spend more time as a congregation. This is every congregation I've been in. More time worrying about managing the Constitution's demands than about whatever the Constitution was there to help us actually do. Yeah, yeah. I th I think that is because we are unable. I think that constitutions always come in where trust is either impossible or trust um, is not believed to be possible. So in the case of the secular constitution for the United States, it was thought by the founders, and I think rightly, to be impossible over a geographic spread and a variety of people and ways of life 
to trust each other totally. So they right. had a balance of powers, etc. Right. I think that that was eminently sensible. I don't think the New Testament displays the same distrust within congregations. Hmm. There are functional congregations. Um, there are dysfunctional congregations. Paul does not write only to dysfunctional ones. Not everywhere is supposed to be Corinth. Right. <laughs> um, in fact, Corinth should be relatively unique. There should be m- many more Philippi's and right. Thessalonica's than, than Corinth. So Christians always need to grow. Christians always need to be focused. These are reasons that Paul writes to them. But Christians should not always need to be admonished that they shouldn't live like all of the non-Christians, nor should they need to be admonished to trust Paul, to trust the man who is leading them. The man who is leading them is there to guide them into the rich pastures of God's word. If everybody understands that, not least himself, everything should be fine. That assumes self-examination and transparency on the pastor's part. Mm. But you find both those things if you look at Paul, for instance. And Paul says, and I said this in the sermon where I introduced close communion at our congregation, I said, my heart is wide open to you. I am not doing anything in secret or for my own aggrandizement. If I wanted to do that, I would go be a stockbroker. Right. I am doing everything because I love you and because I'm trying to build you up with God's word. And when you do that, when you actually just say those kind of things, um, it's amazing. Hmm. And I think that if you study early Missouri Synod history, the real seminal event should not be the fact that Martin Stefan may or may not have abused the trust that was given him, which was maybe excessive, but these people were coming out of a situation that they understood to be apocalyptic. If you read the book to redesign on the Mississippi, which is very, you know, distrustful of Stefan, but in any case, that's the book. I think the seminal event in the early Missouri Synod is the fact that it exists. Mm. The fact that it comes into being after that, Now, how they arranged things constitutionally, whatever, that's fine. And I think a lot of those things, honestly, are culturally determined. They were dealing with a different culture, and especially a culture in which the pastors are university educated and the people generally are not, functions differently, especially in a Germanic culture, than when the people have become Americanized, which is Mm -hmm. certainly true for almost any one of our congregations since the Second World War. So... I don't think that the distrust can be traced to America because America also includes things like the Mormon uh, move westward, which is massive amounts of trust from people who are all pretty much colonially descended. Hmm. I mean, they're more American than almost anybody could be. Um, And they have absolutely massive trust and work very happily communally just on a sociological level. So I don't think that it's intrinsic to being American. I think that it's intrinsic to... Um, having distrust. And also, I would say this, this is really important, not being able to talk openly about why we distrust one another. Hmm. And that is true on the congregation level, on the district level, on the synod level. If you can't talk about it openly, if you can't say, you think this, and I think this, and those two things are different, and they're either, it, either it doesn't matter, or only one of them is right, and here's why. And then what do we do if only one of them is right? If you can't do that, you're going to maintain distrust because you simply, it's like a marriage in which you never actually discuss money. Right. If you don't do that, that doesn't make the problem go away. It just means that you distrust one another concerning money. Well, then it it falls back into uh, personal sway for the sake of power. The only way to get my way is to win. Right. And I can't win in a full frontal assault. I have to win through (laughs) conniving, right? Because if I know these camps are always going to be here and they're never going to talk to each other, then I have to find a way to get my camp to win. And then it always becomes, in the worst sense of the word, political. So tell me about what changed. Tell me about your your congregation's polity, what the Constitution said you had to be when you got there, and then tell me about what it is now. And for the listener, if this bores you, I'm sorry. This is something that I care deeply about. I've thought about it for many years, and I, I think... Adam's got his finger on something. So that's why I want to know. So our constitution, when I got there, um, had um, the pastor and the church council um, working working together and kind of overseeing teams. Um, So we did not have committees. What I changed was um, what is that group focused on? 
Okay. So um, if we have an activity that works for a while, we keep doing it. If it doesn't work, like if we're not getting any new members because of it, if nobody's visiting because we're doing this, we just drop it. So the, the pastor is leading the mission of the church, hmm. and the church council is there to facilitate the church's mission rather than the church council existing in order to oversee a bunch of boards which exist for the sake of either the people occupying the boards or the traditional activities that those boards take up. So yeah, so okay, so then you're actually the beneficiary of the Transforming Churches Network movement. Because what happened was, <laughs> before I got there, my congregation went through Transforming Congregation yeah. Churches Network. Network, yeah. And um, the, the, the big difference that I did not want to go back to was the pastor as CEO model. Right. So what's different about what I'm doing from what's called where, where I think it originated in the United States is the Calvary Chapel movement mm -hmm. with Chuck Smith is sometimes, so it's sometimes called the Moses model hmm. is that the pastor is kind of in charge like Moses or Brigham Young. You're kind of in charge of everything. Yeah. Right. So you are both the one who proclaims God's word, but you're also the one that makes the decision about the like when the parking lot's going to be fixed and stuff like that. And that's actually a lot more common than people realize. Um, for American Christianity. For American Christianity. Yeah. That's a lot more common than people realize. This can fire you too. Yeah. And so you are you are CEO, but yeah, the stockholders might, you know, fire you at a meeting. You know, so that's that's going to be standard, like say in like the Southern Baptist Convention, but it's also standard at least in my area in the ELCA. Okay. So um, I did not want that. Um, I was offered that. I did not want that um, because my job isn't to do everything. My job is to proclaim God's word and to keep us focused on spreading the gospel. Right. So then, who does the other things? I mean, there was this. There is this system in which you have a council and you have all these other boards that are supposed to do something. And if those go away, then that something won't get done and then we won't be church anymore, right? I mean, so the, the yeah, so we have like work groups that accomplish tasks, let's say vacation Bible school or cleaning up the outside of the church or whatever. And those appear and disappear as needed under the supervision of the council and the council for a congregation our size, we have about 135 on Sunday. Um, the council is, I want to say, six or seven folks. And then the council makes that decision as a, a ruling board? like, Or is there a... How does it not end up that there's an individual who takes the lead in the council and ends up being the, the CEO? Well, we have, a, we have a president, and I work with the president. Okay. Um, and the president um, is also usually an elder, uh -huh. so that for him, the church uh -huh. is also focused on the churchly work, let's say the proclamation of the gospel, say it that way, rather than the existence of the organization or the building or whatever it may be. That I, I there's also this when you're when when the church is aware of planting a mission church, things that also seem really important to an established congregation, they get a different perspective on things because like the mission church rents. Right. So when if we're sitting there having a big argument about, I don't know, when we're gonna fix the roof or something. We all have a different perspective on fixing the roof because we understand what the roof is for. Right. That the roof doesn't exist for itself because we know that the mission church doesn't even have its own roof. And some of that, oh man, it, it, that's the conversation then is knowing what these things are for. And part of me thinks that the current, well, I don't, I don't think this, I was going to say that the current constitutions in most Missouri Synod congregations are fine and we could just leave them as they are, but, but they're not because they require like 50 volunteers with, uh, you know, a meeting once a month. It was just, it's, it's insane the amount of workload that's been created to handle, you know, hiring someone to clean the gutters, right? That kind of thing. Uh, so, but you, so it, it, just with that, though, no one would ever think about having an elder also be the chair of the congregation. That, that's like so too much power in one man. Okay. And, and one question there also is, um, how do you find a volunteer that willing to give that much time as yeah. well? That's almost like an associate pastor. Yeah, and it's mind. not required by our congregation, by our constitution or anything. It's just kind of helpful. Um, because we don't operate on a hermeneutic of suspicion with one another. Yeah, yeah. So we only have, we only have one mandatory voters assembly per year, um, 
we have what I call instead. Um, sometimes we vote on things at other times in the year, um, but we have what I call mission meetings. Uh -huh. So we talk, we do like sort of like, here's what's going on at the church in case you haven't you know, been following this or that thing. And then I leave the rest of the time open for them to ask any questions about what's going on. So the, the issue here is, is always transparency. They know that if they talk to me or if they talk to our president or whatever, you're going to get a straight answer. Um, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you or play to you politically. And, you know, that doesn't mean like being offensive or insulting or something. It just means that I'm being open. And that's fine. And it is remarkable that trust is like the gift that keeps on giving. The more mm -hmm. trust that you display in being transparent, the more trust that you receive. Mm -hmm. um, if you display distrust or if you display political power plays or if you display a desire for m more money or more you know, recognition or something, people will give you distrust. Mm -hmm. If you display trust, <laughs> they will give you trust. So you have a council, a board of elders, and then a, do you have a board of trustees too? Or did, did uh, we have like a head too? trustee and then he's got guys that work with him. Right. But so like for, yeah, so for like individual activities, the person who's on the church council will organize or oversee people organizing an activity, an outreach event or whatever. When you elect for council, do you elect people to those unique kind of oversight To the council positions? position, yeah. So like chair of finance, um, uh, head elder, stuff like that. So you still have all of those categories making up the council. For the different, yeah, kind of areas of church life. Uh, but it's so just the people on the council. Can I ask you, are there are there ladies uh, elected to the council? Uh, really just for social ministry, which is like um, parties and like we're going to yeah. have a party. Was with that it. intentional or is that just kind of the that way is, you That out? is intentional. You talk about that. Uh, yeah, it's because um, uh, organizations that... Um, have w women cannot be congregation president and they can't be elders. Um, organizations that um, are run by women um, that also include men, in my experience, universally end up entirely excluding men. Mm -hmm. Men do not want to be any part of those organizations. So that if we are asking men to be heads of their households, we should also ask them to be heads mm -hmm. in the church and to head up the work of the church. Um, children should see their father leading in serving the church as they see him leading in the home. So it's helping our families. Um, it's strengthening the whole congregation to see men leading in every aspect of the congregation. Um, social ministry for us means um, that's kind of like church events. Um, and so the ladies are doing that anyway. So there's really no harm in having a lady head that up. She's, she's organizing other ladies. But we have men lead where men are concerned at all um, because it's good for all of our families to have that happening. There's a poem by Rudyard Kipling uh, entitled The Female of the Species. Yeah, I know. Are you familiar with I that? I am, yeah. Yeah. It, it is, it's interesting to me that there does seem to be um, – men, men can be tyrants, Men often are tyrants, and so back to the hermeneutic of suspicion and, and the lack of trust, and if we let the men be in charge, then the women won't get a say, and oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to me that it's not as though the, the ladies don't have their own need for authority that's actually biblically written, and that their desire will be for the office of a man, I think is what Genesis 3 says, and it, it doesn't go well uh, when, we, when we forget the head of, Every woman is man. The head, or head of head of a wife is her husband. The head of a husband is Christ. The head of Christ is God. And we lose that mindset in the way we practice our theology in the practical theology. Uh, it it doesn't go well for anybody. Yeah. Because the 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 church is only as strong as the families in the church. Hmm. And so if the family is somehow being contravened or um, the order of the family that God has set up is not also displayed in the church. That is only hurting families, um, and therefore it's also actually hurting the church. Um, and we have had no problem getting men to volunteer um, to do things, um, certainly since I've been there. I mean, I, that is a change that I personally made was men can, only men can be elders, only men can be congregation president. And it's been very helpful, and we've always had people ready so to go. So when you say you made that decision, and how did you make that? That's not the kind of decision most pastors are given the authority to make. Yeah, I... Um, we were amending the constitution and they asked me, you know, what's your input on this pastor? It was, it was sort of being amended when I got there, I guess. Uh, yeah. 
and I said, well, the, I think this should be in there. And so that was, they just and, took it. Yeah. That they, they voted on it. I think I, I think I explained in the voters assembly, but only a couple of people even voted against it. So. Huh. I feel like we've only just kind of scratched the surface of, of the political thought. And uh, I know I've asked you in the past for a, a paper copy of this constitution. Cause I want to see what it actually looks like. I don't know how we sell Missouri Synod died in the wool cultural destroying themselves congregations and pastors who are destroying themselves trying to save these congregations on the topics that we've talked about tonight but I really think that they are very much the heterodoxy which has eaten us alive that our our polity is askew and this the distrust is at the heart of it but it's also practically speaking impossible to do what we've set for ourselves to do that the mission of the church is not something that we're really talking about internally very much at all and that the the preaching uh, I, let's, let's just call it the preaching that our life around the actual word of god is atrophied pretty significantly um, how do we sell people on even starting these conversations without it becoming one of suspicion and struggle and power play and is you know that there, there can be rights and wrongs in this without us being you know you and i figure this out so we're better than them yeah. kind of thing right yeah i think i think that some of it will come very naturally once people understand um, that the word of God actually does provide what they need for their lives. Um, the word of God directed me to care deeply about missions in the United States of America because I was a person who grew up without the gospel. Um, and there are a majority of Americans don't go to church. And if so, if we don't care about missions in the United States, we can't expect anybody else to do mm. so. Um, it will also be very natural for people that they will want to trust one another and live in a community which is defined by trust and by love rather than by a suspicion and the sinking feeling that it's all going to go away in 25 years. People will also want to live in a community which is learning and growing rather than one that is stagnant or that feels stale any given Sunday. They will want these things when they see them or hear about them. It's very natural because they're Christians. And they want to grow and they want to be rooted and renewed in Christ and they want to grow up into the full image of him uh, who has saved them. So um, I guess I don't really have any anxiety about it because I feel like it's really natural um, because if we are renewed in the image of Christ, we will want to bear his image and we will want to trust and love and reach out. It's, it's supernatural. It is, uh, you're advocating a trust that the Holy Spirit does make Christians and that Christians know what they need. My question, I guess, is how do we get a a culturally resistant group of people uh, because of the culture? They're, they're, they're holding the culture um, uh, to recognize we've got all the tools right here. But we do. I mean, Harrison said this when he got elected. But then, how do you how do you manage this? You know, it begins with repentance, and that the conservative Missouri still has a lot to repent of. That we aren't a bastion, a Bronze Age. We might be on the Brass Age right now, right? Uh, how do we how do we strip away the dross uh, of ourselves? Get ourselves out of the way. Decrease that the Word of God might increase in our midst. And for my part, the only thing I know how to do is just to unabashedly talk about it more, whether it's in the pulpit, doing the kind of preaching we're talking about, and not caring. You know, <laughs> so what? You don't like it? Oh well. Um, and uh, and then in events like this, uh, not worrying about if I'm going to get you know raked over the coals for it on Facebook or whatever, but to say, look, this is something that's got to be. This has got to change. Um, I, I don't see our churches surviving with these. Uh, I'm going to use Cicero again because I don't know another way to describe it. These, these uh, faux Cicero uh, sermon monologues uh, while we keep our country club going through uh, manip manipulation and machination and, and insisting that you join it, give money and volunteer to it. Nobody wants that. Nobody in, out there wants that. They'd far rather go kneel t three times a day on a rug facing east where at least they know they're getting religion. Right out of the thing, so I don't know if that if that it's a really bad way to end the show right there. Um, uh, let me ask you one last question then, on a totally different direction uh, to maybe close here. Other thing I've been reckoning with this. This gets back to the, you know, 
struggling with how to how does one do a mission and coming to terms with how much jargon we use even just the most ignorant Missouri Synod layman has a lot of jargon that we use we talk about the gospel particularly right. what what the hell is that thing right uh, if i'm talking to somebody who has who has no experience with christianity yeah how do i begin to tell them the gospel and every time i've asked a missouri synod pastor about this they they're like yeah, yeah that's good and then they yeah. start and i can hear it they drop three or four terms within the first sentence all of which have loaded baggage that the listeners they don't have right meaning to those words right, right? yeah uh, have you thought about this and then, i you know, think about it a lot what is the gospel you have to know what kind of terms the person is familiar with so this is going to depend on education level it's going to depend on um what he's interested in what his religious background is to a hindu i'm going to tell him um that life is actually a good thing and he doesn't want to actually escape it Hmm. um to a muslim i'm going to tell him that you know um you can argue lots of points like isaac is the son of promise not ishmael or something but i'm going to tell him that god has displayed his heart to the world. He does not keep it secret. He's not reserving his judgment for the day of judgment. Um, He has shown his heart to the world in Christ. It's just going to depend on the person's capacity to understand what I'm saying. But I'm going to talk about something which is, to put it in the most generic possible terms, far more beautiful, far more life-giving, far more amazing, um, far more any good thing that that person can imagine than he has ever imagined. And that all, all of that is given to him as a gift. It is not something that he has to find or do for himself. I'm here to give it to him. And so what terms those take and, and, and what that looks like is going to depend on the imagination of that person. And then I will frame what I'm saying in terms that he can understand that are comprehensible to him. I think a person who does this extremely well is actually Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia. Hmm. He said, he talks about things like beauty and grace and stuff like that in ways which are work really well in a story and which are comprehensible to children. So I think that when I'm proclaiming the gospel to somebody, I'm always going to tell him about Christ. I'm always going to tell him about the gifts that God has for him in Christ. But I have to wait and understand how he can hear things for me to say them to him before I dump a bunch of words on him that I'm then going to have to go back and define and I'm going to lose him while I'm while I'm defining those theological terms. My my own thinking on this is that I really like what you said. I haven't thought in that direction at all, so it's, it's, I'm going to chew on that. Um, the, histors, the, histi, uh, the historicity of the resurrection is the, is the game changer of all things. That I, I'm not only coming to, pro, I'm not coming to proclaim my religion to you. Right. I'm coming to tell you that history has an end and it already happened right. and it's just it's just the way it is it happens to be really good news and have all that beauty stuff you were talking about but my, my reasoning on this is is acts and just looking at the preaching in acts that whenever these guys talk the first time they talk about his resurrection and they, and they act like this is sort of the thing and that we that doesn't mean that Christ crucified isn't what we preach, right? It doesn't mean that the atonement isn't and justification aren't the real things. They are. But the the hearer who is receptive to those things, the, the the glimmering moment of I blink, I'm awake is wait, what? You said what? He's a what? You know, <laughs> he's alive? And then what does this mean? It leads us into things like you're innocent on judgment day and all that. And so that's that's the direction I've been been leaning in this. But I, I like what you said about uh, it's the becoming all things to all people without becoming a liberal. <laughs> you can well you can you can see it in the way that they preach to different audiences and acts. So they are not mm-hmm. scripture heavy once they get into Greek speaking area into into Hellenistic non Jewish areas, but they're still proclaiming the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Um, they're doing basically text proofing proof texting um, earlier on in Acts when they're talking to Jews. When they right. start talking to people who don't know the Bible, they're, they have the basic story of what happened with Jesus and how this means that there is resurrection and, and judgment. And interestingly, Paul proclaims self-control to pagans who do not have it. Hmm. Um, so that is also part of his proclamation. But what he is really 
able to do so well is to, in both their own language, but also their own terms, to proclaim Christ and him crucified and risen um, such that they understand that their lives should now center around that Christ whom Paul proclaims. Which, again, for, for historic Americans, people who do still think so linearly, that's where I think the resurrection is still the golden ticket. How could that not change everything if, it, if it's true, right. Right? right? If it is actually true. Uh, Pastor Adam, and it is, by the way, listener, Pastor Adam Kuntz, uh, pastor at Mount Calvary Lutheran Church, Lidditz, Pennsylvania, uh, and also working on this mission plan, Concordia Lutheran Mission, concordialc.org. You can hear him more if you enjoy the way he talks at A Word Fitly Spoken. There's a number of interviews with him there. He's on Sharper Iron with me once a month as well. And I hope to have you back on. I think we're going to do some Ezekiel at, at a certain Yeah, that would point. be awesome. That'd yeah. Be good. Uh, once I get this this catastrophe of a room set up with all the sound stuff working the way I wanted to, uh, we're, we're going to do that as well. So um, thank you so much for being Thank you. Well, my pleasure. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? If so, Pastor Fisk and his family would love to have it, in part to pay for technology and paperwork to keep Rev Fisk Raw going, and in part to just enjoy a night out together. Pledging $1.25 on Patreon, only $5 a month, lets the worker know his labor is appreciated. And if you're a true fan, you can give even more. You can find the link to Patreon in the show notes. And check out the other giving levels there, including advertising your product, your family, or your congregation on Rev Fisk Raw. Lock and load, then rock on.